Yeah, or any yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so let's start again with just the immigration. <laughs> I have to edit the film, so I have to have a good beginning. <laughs> ah, Towards the one, the, one. the, the perfection, perfection of love, love, harmony, and beauty. The only being united, united with all the illuminated souls who form the embodiment of the Master, the Spirit of Guidance. So again today, could you call uh, Parker? Jeff? Come on, Sparky. <laughs> Come on, Sparky. Come on. Good boy. So today we're reading um, from the teaching given by peer immersion on the alchemy of happiness. And um, I did want to share a couple of readings that came today in my mailbox because I subscribe to absolutely everything for inspiration. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I get the Tao, I get the glimpse of the glimpse, I get the, you know, glimpse after glimpse of uh, Sylvia Rinpoche's and Mershid's daily um, Bolosaki. So, this relates so much to what Merchant is going to talk to us about in this teaching. Every blow in life pierces the heart and awakens our feelings to sympathize with others. And every swing of comfort lulls us to sleep and we become unaware of all. And it is so very easy for us to forget that we are so privileged and live in a peaceful world for the most part. And we have food to eat and wa clean water to drink. You know, that our comforts do lull us to sleep. And it's only when we suffer. We have some incident where we, you know, break a foot and we can't walk as easy. Or, you know, we, we understand what it's like to be lame momentarily. Or, you know, if we are hungry or we don't get enough rest, you know, but there are people that live in these conditions every moment. And so to have that sympathy, that compassion is, is a great gift, but often it has come at the cost of the pain of our own hearts. And then from glimpse after glimpse, this is a bit longer, but it's really beautiful. And it, you, it's, it's, it has humor in it as well. Imagine that you had gone all your life without ever washing. And then one day you decide to take a shower. You start scrubbing away, but then watch in horror as the dirt begins to ooze out of the pores of your skin and stream down your body. Something must be wrong. You were supposed to be getting cleaner. And all you can do is keep crying. You panic and you fling yourself out of the shower, convinced that you should never have begun. But you only end up even more dirty than before. You know, you have no way of knowing. You have no way of knowing that the wisest thing to do is to be patient and to finish the shower. It may look for a while as if you're getting even dirtier, but if you keep on washing, you will emerge fresh and clean. It's all a process, and the process is purification. The significance of our purification breath every day. Whoever doubts, when, what, excuse me, where, whenever doubts arise, see it, simply as an obstacle. Recognize it as an understanding that is calling out to be clarified and unblocked. And know that it is not a fundamental problem, but simply a stage in a process of purification and learning. Allow the process to continue and complete itself. There's just so much what we don't want to do. We want to often <laughs> stop it. Like, oh my God, this feels really awful. I want to stop this. Let me distract myself. You know? So Gil Rinpoche talks about that a lot, how we distract ourselves. 
we can impede our pro progress along the way. Allow the time to continue and complete itself and ne never lose your trust or resolve. This is, this is the way followed by the great practitioners of the past who used to say, there is no, no armor, there is no armor like perseverance. So it's like that little red engine that keeps trying to get up the hill and all the other big engines are passing it, but it keeps going, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. Now I can. How amazing is that? So, in the words of Pierre Mershit, he says this to us. We often confuse happiness with pleasure. We often, that, that's it really, the whole thing is, we often confuse happiness with pleasure. But pleasure is an illusion, a shadow of happiness, and in this illusion we may pass our whole life seeking after pleasure and never finding satisfaction. There is a Hindu saying that the person who looks for pleasure finds pain. So it's as if we have this attachment to a feeling a kind of way, and when we don't feel that way, then it becomes painful to us. Oh, just another story about Sogyal Rinpoche's teaching. Um, I think Medita was there with me. She may have been with me when I asked the question. But my, my uh, Buddhist teacher, Pamtil Rinpoche, had asked me to go to the temple, the main temple of His Holiness, to do my prostrations. And I didn't want to. Because I had judgments about the Westerners up there doing their prostrations with the Tibetans. I thought it was kind of an appropriation of practice and you know, could be viewed as arrogant and show off the, oh, here I am, I'm being so holy, doing my practices. And then Rinpoche said, no. What it does is it inspires others to do the practice when they see you. So as I was doing these practices, there's several, there's mantra, there's this prostration, there are several things that you do that are part of a purification process when you begin on the path. And you do them all a thousand and one times. So it's great yoga, you get very fit. But what I saw was not myself getting better, but myself getting worse. Like my thinking, my emotions, my mind, so one day I was at a little cafe and there was a, a llama there and I looked at him. I could tell he spoke English and speaking English. And I said, can you tell me, uh, the more I do these purification practices, the more I feel I'm getting to be a bad person. And he said, that's part of the process. It's like the shower. Mm. And so I wanted to bring that into a sort of a crystallized. So as we do during, you know, think about the word enlightenment in lighten. Do you think that that's like, la di da now I'm going to feel great, I'm enlightened? No. It means you're going to see all the grime and the stuff. You're going to see your stuff with clarity. But the trick is, is not be attached to that either. Just see it as part of the process. And, and Anaya Khan will be explaining that to us. Also, he's giving us a process, which we'll do as a part of this class. So he says, every pleasure seems as a happiness in outward appearance. It promises happiness, but it's a shadow of happiness, just as the shadow of the person is not the person. They're representing their form. So pleasure represents happiness, but it is not happiness in reality. So I think we can start to ask ourselves, what makes us feel happy? What makes us feel happy? Or what is the condition of happiness for us? Maybe not something that makes us feel happy, but what is that condition? When do we experience it? Mercia goes on to say, the more we study life, the more we realize how rarely it is the soul who can honestly say, I'm happy.
Almost every soul, whatever their position, will say they are unhappy in some way or another. Oh, I wish I had a better car. Oh, I wish I had a bigger house. Oh, I wish I had a nice whatever companion. Oh, I wish I, you know, I wish that things were different at my job. You know, there's always a little something nibbling at us. And Mercia goes on to explain that in the teachings. I've edited that out here for conciseness, but one can imagine because we we all go through that. He goes on to say. The person who's really happy is happy everywhere. In a place or in a college, cottage, <laughs> in a college, <laughs> in riches or in poverty, for that person has discovered the fountain of happiness, which is situated in their own heart. As long as a person has not found that fountain, nothing will give real happiness. So it's like we have to go within and find that. And you know, like um, we have to prime a pump. We have to do that for ourselves. Years ago, I remember studying, um, well, I, I'm still a Smithsonian pres prescriber, subscriber, prescriber. <laughs> and you know, they do talk about it. And we know this was years ago. This probably was three decades ago or more when I was reading this. But now they've done many, many studies where they talk about uh, the act of even smiling makes you feel better. Mm. That it sets up all these neurotransmitters and hormonal functions in the brain. So just smiling. And Merchant, of course, gives that teaching, the smile on your forehead. You know, keep that kind of smile within. It doesn't even really have to be on the lips. It can just be a kind of inner smile. Happiness cannot be bought or sold, nor can you give it to a person who has not got it. Now that's futile because we know we try to do that with our loved ones. We want them to be happy. We are uncomfortable with other people's unhappiness. I remember after my father suddenly died, people at the college when I returned to work said, how are you doing? So how do you think I'm doing? And I said, Are you, can you be okay with me not being okay? That's what I really need. Mm -hmm. Can you be okay? Can you support me while I'm in this not okay phase? You know, that, that that's sometimes what we really need. And I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to be honest and true. I wanted to be functional, and I was. But, you know, I just didn't want to have to say, I'm okay. You know, I'm sad. You know, how well, would you feel? So it's the way it is, but it doesn't mean I was in sadness all the time. In fact, if you've been in grief and you find yourself laughing, sometimes you feel perhaps you've forsaken the one you're grieving over. It can happen that way too. But finding that fountain within, not expecting that it's something we draw into ourselves, but that it is something within ourselves. And it is not based on causes and conditions, certainly not external ones. Happiness cannot be bought or sold, nor can you give it to a person who has not got it. Happiness is your own being, your own self, that self that is the most precious thing in life. Now, I do want to say this. You know, I've taught in an art and design field, which draws people to it that maybe have the predisposition for manic depression and things. That's part of the creativity. They may have uh, levels of autism. Again, it's part of the creativity. But when it comes to the point where they can't uh, function is when the point when I've often interceded and, you know, called it. And so do you recognize what's going on here. Because I think there can be impediments to us reaching that fountain. I mean, some people are clinically depressed or they get very high and then they get very low. And I, I recognize those conditions. Um, they've been in our family. And so I've said, you know, seeing a doctor is not the worst thing that could happen for you. If you were diabetic, you would take insulin. 
If you have heart disease, you would be taking something. This is something your body's doing. So I'm saying that because I, I, I do believe in the practices. I know how they've changed my life. But I think sometimes people also have medical conditions that need to be addressed. And hopefully you have a good friend or someone observing you that can help you. Call, call that if that's true. We often talked about that in leadership within the Sufi organizations regarding spiritual healing. Um, that it, it's good to have the spiritual aspect. We know how effective that is. And yet modern medicine can do a lot for us as well. As for the question of how, oh, let me go back a minute. All the wise ones have in some form or another given a method by which the individual can find that happiness for which the soul is seeking. That happiness which the soul is seeking. It's as if we've gotten thrust. It's like uh, being a, a yo-yo. And God's holding the string of the yo-yo and we get cast out into the world. We're still connected. We forget it. We get, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that, oh I like that. And then we kind of lose that connection. So the soul is always seeking that connection, seeking that connection. Sages and mystics have called this process alchemy, hence the title of the paper, The Alchemy of Happiness. As for the question of how this method of alchemy is practiced, the whole process was explained by the alchemist in a symbolical way. They said gold is made out of mercury. For those who have consciousness, have the consciousness of reality, gold stands for light, for spiritual inspiration. Gold represents the color of light, and therefore an unconscious pursuit after light has made humanity seek for gold. There's a beautiful story in the What's the title of that book that Moshe Dayak wrote about his mother and father? I don't know, it's stories of my mother and father, but he talks about the time when, uh, because you know Sufis often uh, are connected with the color of green. But that's also the color of Islam, or and that's also the color of Islam. Part of the reason for that is, think about where Islam was birthed. In the desert. How precious was it for them to come upon an oasis and the green was there? That was where the medicine was. That was, it happens to be where the Sufis live in Morocco or in the oasis. They're the peace builders, they're the you know, medical people. They understand the oasis and the life of them. So one day, Mershid, Pure Mershid, an icon wanted to go to the market. And uh, Mershad Hadayat was very protective of his father. And he insisted that he go with him. He had to protect him. He was a little boy. Nonetheless, he went. And they went to a fabric store. And Mershad bought reams upon reams of gold fabric. And then he asked, this was in Seren, and they had a building that was for just for summer school and study, a meditation hall there. And he asked that the color be stretched across the whole front of the uh, meeting hall. And he said, now this is the, the color. And you notice that many of the sheikhs and merchants will often wear a gold color or sash in their robes or you know, or in a sash when they're leading sick or whatever. We used to do it a lot more than we do now. But this is a this is part of the reason that this is the light. It is a, and Richard also said that this was a new movement, you know. So he gave the message. 
drawing upon all the ancient traditions, but also at this new dispensation. The real interpretation of this process is that Mercury represents the nature of the ever restless mind. The nature of Mercury is to be ever moving. But by a certain process, the Mercury is first stilled. So think about that. This is called so many things in different traditions, the monkey mind, the flea that's constantly jumping. I mean, all you have to do is sit in meditation, try to watch your breath, and you see first the mind goes that way, it goes that way, it goes that way, it goes that way. We start to think about all kinds of things. If you've ever done a meditation practice where you sit and count to 10, all kinds of things arise before you get to 10. And you're supposed to start over again. If you, you know, one, two, oh, I wonder if I should look at, you know, okay, start again, one, oh, I want to see, what am I going to eat for lunch? Okay, one. So you keep starting because you notice this nature of mind is so busy. You know, part of it is we're wired that way for survival, but then we're conditioned that way. But what if we can still the mind like we can Mercury? Then Mershit says, when by the first method of concentration, one has mastered the mind, one has taken the first step in accomplishment of this sacred task. And then he goes on to say, prayer is concentration. I often find myself happy to go back because I realize I've gotten to the end of a prayer and I haven't really thought about the words at all. Does anyone else do that? It's like, well, I'm, 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 amen. Wait, what did I just say? <laughs> no. You know, and I go back. I make myself really think about it because I, it can be for rote. So prayer is concentration, but focusing on the prayer is concentration. Reading is concentration. Now, I don't know if Mershit here is talking about a romantic novel or a detective story. Probably not. He's probably talking about some sort of sacred text. And when we read those, I've been instructed, I shared that with you, that you read just a portion of it, like might be one or two paragraphs to get to a complete thought. And then you concentrate on that for a day or a week or whatever. Then the study becomes a lifelong process. And every time we read something, it's new, it's different. Oh, I see that in a completely different way. Mershit says sitting and relaxing and thinking on one subject, these are all concentrations of prayer reading, sitting and relaxing in a kind of equipoise and keeping the mind focused is a concentration. Stilling the mind is a special method which is necessary and which are taught by the mystics. Have you ever gone to a science museum and they have those, um, like a, a kind of large uh, concave surface and there are things dancing on it. Have you ever seen that? It's from the vibration of the sound. So the sand does different things or little oh, balls yeah. jump around. Well, that is like what the, that can be like what we can focus on the mirror of the heart. And the, then there are these little mercury balls that are moving and moving, moving and moving. But we're trying to do is get them still. When the mind is under perfect control, it is no longer restless. One can hold a thought at will as long as one wishes. This is the beginning of the phenomenon. So let's just imagine again this mirror in the heart. It could be like a silver platter. Sometimes the image of a clear lake without a ripple is there and is often given as part of this practice. But for, and you can use that, but at some point we'll transform that into kind of a silver platter. Or it could be a silver sphere. That's why I asked you, which way is the mirror oriented? Is it oriented out? Is it oriented facing? Is it oriented up? Is it oriented down? 
or can it be three-dimensional? So whatever it is, we want to make it very still, very calm. Just a clear reflective surface. And here I call to mind what Dear Valiant and I, Colin would often say to us in leaders' training, an image is never tarnished by the images that are cast upon it. A mirror is never tarnished by the images that are cast upon it. So when hurtful things happen or disagreements happen, remember, that is something coming towards you, but it doesn't have to become tarnish on the mirror. Every one of us is a, a child of God, and by such, we have that light, that beautiful light inside. It is our job to take that good shower, like so Gilbert Bache said, and purify it from those impressions. Now, sometimes it helps to not just visualize. I've had people say to me, I, I have a hard time visualizing something. So sometimes using the language of wazifa can help us. And so, as Mersha described here, that when we're seeking after gold, what we're really seeking is light. Now, I'll tell you something. When I don't know Salima, maybe Marshida Vera did this to you as well. But when I asked her for initiation, she asked me, well, what, what are you hoping to gain from the path? What do you need? What do you need most in life? She said. And without hesitation, ask yourself that just for a moment before I answer. What it is, if someone asked you that right now, what is it that you're seeking most in life? What do you think you need most in life? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Hmm. And we want to take a guess what I said? <laughs> <laughs> One guess. Contentment. <laughs> Love. Those are all good things, though. I know. Light. I know the story. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> Light. 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 And she said, your name's Noria. Because I mm. knew if I had light, I would have that torch to carry with me to illuminate my path. And there was nothing more important than that for me, is to be able to see clearly. Because I think sometimes it's like that roomy story of the blind men with, or, in the, or men in the dark room with the elephant. You know, one touches one part. You know, this is life. Life can be very confus confusing to us. People can be very confusing to us. We are confusing to ourselves. <laughs> oh, yes. That can be the most confusing. So having light for me was very important, but I think peace could be important and love can be important. And all these qualities, you know, dance of life can be important. Sympathetic joy, you know, all the radiance, all those things, insight. So those things you have to ask for yourself. Invoke that quality, maybe speak to your teacher about it. So I work a lot in this, this class. I often bring in that quality of more. Um, you see, we use that pair coupled with practices. But here, I know it's a little ahead in this teaching. So I also know that we need to feel love. And that love is an unconditional love without attachment. Mersha would describe it as indifference. We give the love. You know, people say, I don't understand when Mersha says, independence and indifference. But he means giving 
and loving without expectations. So let us couple the sacred word, the divine name, Nur, which is divine light, its luminosity. But one could think of it as, you know, we know that, that when you look at something under a microphone, microphone, um, a microscope, you see that everything's really sparkling and dancing with light. So it's described that our every particle of our being is light. We're all the same stuff. We're just slightly configured in different ways. And then we're going to couple that with Badud, love. So, and that and that's an interesting one. You know, um, I know when my mother was quite ill, and uh, I knew that we had to start making arrangements for things some years before we had some mourning because she had cancer. And I said, Mom, you know, maybe we should, I thought if I do it, she'll do it with me. Maybe we should get a marker. We have a family plot in a cemetery not far from here. And um, we had some spaces that were designated for us. Although I don't just really want to be buried, but we could have a marker there. So I said, let's get a marker and let's get an, you know, we both have a great affinity for St. Teresa of the Little Fire, St. Teresa of Lisieux, and she talks about love a lot. And I said, uh, let's pick a cloak and let's put our names and our date of birth. I mean, who cares after a certain time they're going to know we're dead, you know? <laughs> so we don't have to put that on there. Let's just get them made up and let's put this quote and give St. Teresa the and so, so when someone looks at it, they just don't look, oh, poor person, they died then and they did, they, did, they lived then and they, oh, they were so young, or that, actually, they were so old, but there'd be an inspirational line that they could maybe read, right? So uh, mom asked if I could help pick out some quotes and, and have her choose, so I did. And it was interesting that um, she didn't want the quote of love on her stone. She ended up using, I think, it, but it was more like a prayer. It was about prayer, and prayer is the fulcrum. I think that was it. Prayer is the fulcrum that can lift the world. I think that's what she wanted, because she believed so much in prayer. And uh, she said, I'm not so sure I believe in love. But I knew at that moment that Mother was thinking of personal love, because she had great faith. So I know she loved God, and I believe she believed God loved her. But it was a very interesting for her to say that. And I know she loved us very much, but it's interesting. So we have to think about that word love and what does it mean to us. Now here it's this you know inherent quality of the universe that embraces us. That by our very birth we are love and we are loved. And it also is this antidote for when difficult situations arise. Um, you know, I love that Beatles song, all, all You Need Is Love, you know. And when you're in love, even if someone's not sending love towards you, you can be in a state of peace and have that connection to that stream within, the gold within. And you realize that the other person is suffering because they're not. If we can catch ourselves, we can do a lot of good for ourselves and for the other. Um, there have been times when I was in India and I was with some Tibetans and you could see they, you know, they strongly had PTSD. Am I saying it right? I get my letters mixed up. But, you know, P, whatever. You know what I'm talking about, post-traumatic shock. And, you know, they were tortured, beaten, didn't try to escape, and you know, it was just, and sometimes it would come out in a very awkward way. And I didn't know what to do to help, except for I'd walk up, and it could be in kind of an inner crisis, like going through things, I would just walk up and hug them. And then that anger could turn into crying. They were allowed to do that. So Wadud is like that. When you need it the most, 
someone comes, the universe does, comes and embraces you. So we're looking to get the mirror in the heart. And by breathing into it, Yanur Yawadud, we start to <coughs> still the mercury balls dancing on it. So we'll just um, say the Waziva aloud on a kind of tone 11 times, and then we'll just whisper it. Breathing in Noor and out Wadud like this. Noor Wadud. Noor Wadud. And then we just whisper, breathing in Noor and out Wadud. And just let this mirror become polished and still. Ya Ya Wadud. Ya Nur Ya Wadud 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 Last time Ya Nur Ya Wadud Now breathe in Nur and out Wadud Just on the whisper Concentrating on the mirror and the heart. Breathing in silently, nor and out silently, water. So this is the first step, and, and 
if you can or feel inclined, and again, if you have another teacher, you can check in with them. But this might be a good process to do every day. You could again just do the wazifa 11 times, but concentrate every day. Stage one, the mirror of the heart, stilling the mirror of the heart. If it helps, think of it as a lake being still and clearly reflecting everything in it. And you can use these sacred words. Now the second process Mersha begins to describe here. He says, the silver must be heated before it can melt. So here we have this mirror, and I think in the beginning I mentioned, perhaps it's polished silver, and it can be polished silver. If you like, it could even be glass. Glass can also be melted. But in this instance, he's talking through that process of mercury to silver to gold. So the second part of the process is the silver must be heated before it can melt. And with what? It's melted with the love and tolerance and sympathy and service and humility and unselfishness. In a stream which rises and falls in a thousand drops, each drop of which could be called a virtue, all coming from the one stream hidden in the heart of the love element. And when it flows in the heart, then the actions, the movements, the tone of voice, the expression, all show that the heart is warm. The moment this happens, a person really lives. And a person has unsealed the spring of happiness, which overcomes all that is jarring and inharmonious. So there's an interesting thing here. I've read this line again and again. The question is, what is jarring and what is in the harmonious? And where is that coming from? Do we expect that the whole world is going to change for us? Sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> and how do we feel when it doesn't? It just doesn't work really well. <laughs> we feel very disappointed and let down, right? So I think what Mershad is suggesting is those influences that come from within rise up to meet that what is coming from without. But if you could maybe think again, someone's frantic, gave you the example in India, and instead of you reaching out, which is also the tendency, because again, it's survival, you know, we want to lash out or react, protect ourselves, sometimes with harsh words or action. Maybe a look or a breath, too. But, oh my gosh, these teachings really put us in the test of fire. Can we control that, those small self-impulses in us? And if we start to refine, you know, if there's nothing there, if the mirror is really clear, it's just slick. Things just slide off of it. It's hard to do. I'm not saying it's easy. My God, I get a million chances a day to practice it. But I try to recall it and catch myself. It's so easy to slip. That's why they call it the razor's edge. Being on the path is like the razor's edge. You slip very easily and hurt yourself for others. So take oneself to task. So these jarring, you know, that the, the moment this happens, I'm going to go back a couple sentences. Would anyone like to hear that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Silver must be heated before it can be before it can be mel melted. And of course, in this uh, reading I gave of Mershans today, he talked about the pains. Or you know, there's another beautiful phrase: um, the minute my heart is struck by a blow. Uh, the, the rock of the heart breaks open and light emerges. So that these things, it's like a flint. Again, I saw that with the Tibetans because they always carried it in there. They had a little waist thing. 
and they use that to start fires. It's the spark, but it's the friction. So when we have the friction in our lives, it's like, is this that obst those obstacles that Soto Rinpoche was calling us to remember? But those are the things that we have to let ourselves go through a process. No one said it was going to be easy. And we're, none of us are getting out of it alive either. So, you know, we might as well try to be awake, carry the torch of wisdom, of light, of gold. So, silver must be heated before it can be melted. And with what? With love, with tolerance, with sympathy, with service, with humility, with unselfishness, in a stream that rises and falls in a thousand drops, each drop of which could be called a virtue blushing all coming from the one hidden stream in the heart, the love element. And when it glows in the heart, then the actions, the movements, the tone of voice, the expression, all show that the heart is warm. The moment this happens, a person really loves. And having unsealed the spring of happiness, which overcomes all the jarring and inharmonious, all that is jarring and inharmonious. And the spring has established itself as divine stream. Just look that word up in the database. I always have the link there. But if you look up the words love stream, worship refers to that again and again. And he talks about all the prophets having been the love stream. This is, uh, distinguishes a saint and a prophet is the love stream arising from their heart. It's a beautiful image. And do you know one only has to look at a fountain or a stream to think of that? You know, in a stream there can be obstacles. In a fountain, you know, it can be turned off, it can be frozen, it can change colors, it can get polluted. We want to keep our stream purified. Again, the purification breaths every day. Very important. So sage, stage two is warming the heart and it's putting the silver into the fire. And Merchant says, there's a quote that I've drawn upon because again, it was from the bowl of sake this week. And he says, devotion is proved by sacrifice. Well, what greater sacrifice could there be than offering ourselves into the sacred fire for transformation? I remember we were at a family gathering a year or so ago, and I had a cousin that had a little splinter in her finger. And she was like, this hurts so much. And I said, compared to all the suffering in the world, really? She said, yeah, I should stop complaining. But you know, we take little things and we make them really big deals. I, I've often used a technique, perhaps it's called denial or projection or whatever, but Whenever I've been in a really difficult situation, I think of myself as Winnie Pooh, like gotten stuck in that tree, my butt's hanging out in the back, and I'm reaching so hard for the honey, which is just not reachable, and then I'm getting stung all over the place by the bees that don't want me there. Just think of yourself. You're caught in a little knot hole of the universe. It will pass. You'll get through it. If you just look at your life, if you look back, surely there's wisdom that can carry you forward. I had a student, and that person will remain nameless. They were in absolute despair, and they lived in a country where euthanasia is legal. And the person thought there was no way out except for that. It was a condition of the mind and also health. And they wrote to me and said, I've acquired the means to do this, and I'm seriously considering it. And you know what I said? If you think that's the only way, then do it. If you think that will make you happy, then do it. But give it a little time to think about it. And recently, that person has written and said, I'm enjoying life so much. I'm so glad I didn't take that step. And I said, please always remember that. When life gets hard, give it a little time. It will change. 
Now we may have to put effort into changing it, and it may not feel good for a while. Change in life is like a grieving process. You don't get over a grief in a day, you know? I think they say it takes six weeks to break a habit. And of course, in many traditions, it's people aren't hearing me or I'm taking too long. You can't hear me? Okay. I wonder if that one who wants to live can hear you. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll keep I'll try to project. But when uh, I've lost my train of thought, what was I saying? Change in life. Is like Change is like it's a grieving process. And I think that in many traditions, you know, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, and so forth, they get this process of doing practices for what is it, seven weeks, Joe, something like that? Six, seven weeks. But it's, it's important because we do find that if you've had any kind of habit of uh, drinking or smoking or drugs or anything, you know that the physical part at least leaves. It might be, uh, you might have an uh, emotional attachment to it, but often things change after a certain amount of time. So in this person's life, it was very important. You know, I, I was willing to give them permission, but I suggested they wait a little while. And that, things change. But change, things will change again. That's what I reminded them. And when they get difficult again, remember this time. So we have to get perspective. Sometimes looking back can make us very strong. We see the nature of impermanence. And that often when difficult things have happened, although they've been very challenging, perhaps even very hurtful, it's been that very thing that's gotten us to that next step. So here we're talking about warming the heart. So we're willing to take this platter, this mirror, and offer it to the fire. And there's a phrase that is often used in um, uh, Ishkala Ma Buddha Ma is used. But when we think of just the phrase ish for this part of the process, it means this fervent love for an object or a person or for God. Most often we use it in our Sufi circles, ish for God, you know, big love, not little love. And it's described in, excuse me, in Sufi poetry, it's often um, used to describe uh, the selfless and burning love for God. the selfless and burning love for God. So we're going to imagine that we're opening a great furnace and we're offering this silver mirror or platter into the fire and we'll say ish 11 times aloud and then breathing in and out And then just on the breath, and think of it like every time we say ish, it's like the bellows that we're using to fan the flames, to melt that platter of selfhood merging into the fire. Ish. 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 And now on the breath. Breathing, let this furnace burning within the heart transform this solid platter into molten gold. Breathing in, ish, and out, ish, silently.
know if you've ever seen, and I use that image on our website, if someone's forming glass, how the glass, no matter what color it is, becomes molten shape in the fire. It's gold in color. And then the last part is process. Is after the heart is warmed with the divine element, which is love. The next step is the herb, which is the love of God. So uniting this love in the heart with the love of God, letting it come through. But the love of God alone is not sufficient. The knowledge of God is also excuse me, is also necessary. Now that's a challenging thing. How do we gain knowledge of God? Unless we have some sense of introspection, some sense of something unfolding in our lives, we see the value of everything and every person, no matter how much it does give us the feeling of joy or despair, it's all part of it. Knowledge of God strengthens one's belief in God. It throws a light on the individual and on light. So when something's arising, ask oneself. Most especially in difficulties, because that's where people often turn to God. Is what is this? What am I to learn from this process, from this situation, from this person? Then Moshe said, things become clear. Every leaf on a tree becomes a page of a holy book, one of our Sufi thoughts, the holy manuscript of nature is the only book that can illuminate the reader. So every leaf of, on a tree becomes a page of a holy book to one whose eyes are open to the knowledge of God. When the eyes, these eyes? Where are the eyes? Where are your eyes? The eyes and the ears of the heart. Different, different eyes. When the juice of the herb of divine love is poured on the heart, warmed by the love of one's fellow beings, sister beings, then the heart becomes the heart of gold. The heart that expresses what God would express. When this happens, then verily everything that comes from such a person, person becomes the expression of God. And I know that each of you likely have had the opportunity, either in person or watching YouTube, had an experience, because I don't think it's conditional on place and time, but to see or hear someone that is truly a holy being. And when you're even, sometimes you maybe have met someone, you know, or in Sufi traditions, we said have an interview. But when you go there, there's not even a question in your mind because everything seems clear in front of that person. It's like the clouds dissipate. So wouldn't we like to be that being that offers comfort and love and companionship? without taking from the self, the small self. Sometimes the small self has to take care of oneself too, from the physical point of view. Don't be impractical. The Buddhists call that idiot compassion. Mm -hmm. huh. Those questions are often asked of the lamas that come to visit. They say, that's idiot compassion. There's, there's a, everyone, you have to use your mind too. You have to be smart about it. And the first thing to check is, am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating right? Am I exercising right? These three things can cure a lot. And do I have a regular routine in my schedule? Routine is very important for the health. Eating at the same time, sleeping at the same time, rising at the same time, so forth. So let's talk about this sacred herb. What is that? It's a good question, isn't it? Any, any 
takers or how does it how can it be experienced? Have you experienced it? Like inwardly, that idea of a sacred bird passing over the heart. Is there some anything that anyone would we will ask you at, at home to what came to my mind was just the balm of love when they talk about the the skin in the desert with the Bedouins and the the mm. skin holds their water or what they like to drink and it has to be kept moist because if it dries up, like if the heart dries up, then it's, you know, empty, but not in a good way. Or it's cracked. So if, the, yeah. if this cracks, if the skin cracks, then it leaks. Yeah. So there's a balm that's, you know, to keep it moist, to keep it supple. So I think that has to be the balm. Or the herb of love. Yes. That's one. That's one way. And it is. And, and the ish is that. Hmm. Oh, similarly, I, I was thinking of that. The ancient processes of of pharma, pharmaceuticals, in a sense, coming from the plants. But it's the essence of that that one is extracting. That that has that property and so it, it relates to the balm to me too. It's it's the carrier of the yeah. essence. So it's tending to something that it needs to be constantly tended to, you know, and we kind of massage the heart. Is there a good process for massaging the heart? Breath. Breath. Zigger. Huh? Gratitude. So, gratitude. Yeah, gratitude and love mm -hmm. they say are the best. But like the herb you're talking about, well, the herb doesn't just stand there as a plant and I'm an herb, now look at me or whatever and I'm going to heal you. It usually gets crushed. Mm -hmm. It gets boiled. You know, these are the things that happen. My sister had mentioned the chickpea story, you know, that wonderful one where the chickpea is us and the, the shake, the teacher is bopping us down in the pot telling us we're not cooked enough. So sometimes we have to have trials from the boiling pot to get cooked enough. There are these processes in the different traditions we hear the word sat-chit-nand, truth, consciousness, bliss. And it's of this very subjective experience leading us to the ultimate experience. So we have this subjective world, this objective world. This is a big discussion in Sufi philosophy. You can kind of get lost in it, you know, the implicit the explicit. I mean, there's all this dialogue in philosophy, but it is part of this, that subjective and the ultimate, the objective, the subjective. It's Amrit. We hear that word Amrit. We have someone in our community named Amrita, and it's this word, this word that means immortality. And Patanjali, the Patanjali sutras are very important because they talk about this process leading to samadhi or this meditative absorption. So you can see that Merchant's pointing to this process that first we're stilling the mind, then we're offering it into this divine fire. And then we become, and, and I know that all of you have touched that place where you almost like, you kind of don't even know what, what's just happened. I don't even feel my body anymore. I, become so absorbed in a practice or a prayer. In a moment, I touch something where I'm completely absorbed and dissolved in a way. So in Pat, the Patanjali Sutras, now he's going to be very good, I hope, with the mailman here, which turns him into a wrathful <laughs> deity. <laughs> you can hear them, thank goodness. So it's talked about in these different ways. And these are the three practices Mershit is giving us here. This Focused attention. That could be the breath. No, Parker, it's okay. That's right. So it's called the, the, in the tradition of Patanjali, it's called Dharana, which means focused attention. Focusing the attention which we did on the mirror, the lake of the heart. And then it's dhyana, 
And this is effortless meditation. If you, if uh, some of you that do the turn, you've had that experience where all of a sudden you're in the turn, but the minute you realize you're in the turn, you start to wobble, mm -hmm. right? And the minute you say, oh, I am, aren't I doing this just right? Oh, we lose that concentration. We're no longer it. We're thinking about it. Okay, so that's, but effortless meditation is, is that second phase. And then this all leads to this true essential nature, which is without any distortion of the mind. Mind, the mind, the mind. Mind is very helpful, but it can also be very uh, confusing and deliberating and all kinds of things. So samadhi in the mind is this concentrated state that is like a laser beam. I was talking with someone that they felt that their exercise and their diet had really helped them become very focused and very concentrated. But these things can help us, and I think that's why many of the, the beings they suggest not doing certain things and doing certain things, not eating certain things mm -hmm. and eating certain things, because they can help us along the way. But the bottom line is this herb is like this. One could talk about it as kundalini arising, which is a physical process in which the whole entire brain gets bathed in this beautiful experience, and then there's calm. There's no longer self and other. There's just this great peace and calm and clarity. And so that is something to, to look for, hallmarks of progress in our meditation, these different stages. So the last stage that Mershav is referring to is this pure expression of God. And just as ish is this fervent longing uh, the desire to possess something. Ishkala Mabud Allah is the irresistible desire to obtain to the beloved, but also the understanding that it is the only remedy to cure us from any deficiency in ourself. And when we accomplish that, we come to a state of perfection which could be called Kamal, you have Jalal, Jamal, and Kamal, but it's this kind of balanced stillness. Again, referred to as Patanjali, as meditative absorption. Now, it's interesting to me that in doing some research on this teaching, that there's reference to this actually you know, if you if you know that also in these dialectical debates and discussions of Islamic scholars and Sufi scholars, they bring in Plato and Socrates. In I mean, you know, it doesn't just get birthed in and of itself. There is a lineage and a tradition that it's a, an evolution, that one might say, or draws upon. And in Greece, the Greek influence. Joe's more of an expert than I am, but there is this view of the notion of beauty, good, and truth. Beauty, good, and truth. Three things. And think about it. In our tradition, we have love, harmony, and beauty. And that all of these together then result in this indissolvable, or indis yeah, in, in, you know, it's just dissolvable unity. And we talked about that a few classes go with the ahad, the ahad unity, where everything is as significant as everything else. Worship referred to it as all the prophets are not singular, but they're part of this unit of whole, and where we can think of it as a circle without a circumference, ever widening and embracing. So we will use this phrase, ishkala mabudala, and we often hear it if we're introducing that phrase in a zikr or in a dance, we say, oh, God is love, lover, and beloved. Well, I think about that a lot. What does that really mean? What do those words really mean? It's easy to say, but what do they mean? 
But if you look deeper into it, check the philosophers, they talk about it as this hierarchical order. Ishka, it's almost like a, um, Gate Gate Paragate, the Prajna Paramita. It's beyond this, it's beyond that, and it's beyond that. So this is love, lover, and beloved. It's a progressive phase of, I'm referring to my notes here, natural love. This could be a love that we feel or an affection that we feel for people, our families, our home, maybe between a man and a woman or a man and a man and a woman and a woman, whatever that preference is, matters not to be most important that we love. Very important. Expression of love is as important, more important than how we love. That we love is important. Just because of the bias. It can be an attachment with an attachment. So natural love. That's the first level. Then the next level is intellectual love. I want to understand this better. And some people stop there. They do a lot of reading, a lot of study. They have a lot of words. They know a lot of stuff. But what is it really doing for their lives? And the last phase is this divine love. It really transforms us into love. And it's good to ask ourselves, perhaps throughout the day, or in certain situations, where am I on that scale? It's, I mean, I think it's always good. You know, Mersha talks about it. I've heard Dalai Lama talk about it. We are the laboratory. Our life is the great experiment that's pointing us towards illumination and enlightenment. We can take those things in our lives as a, a school of life. Don't they say that? A school of life. So let us say, Ish Allah, Mabud Allah, 11 times with great devotion, into the heart, into the heart. Parker, Parker, there's a white car out there, and people, Parker, he's doing it. Let's say, pretend he's saying, Ish Allah, Mabud Allah. He loves his responsibilities. Um, you know, this is this is a good example. Now he's inside of his house in his little abode, and he's protecting it. You know, it's like a dog with a bone. It maybe doesn't even want that bone. Merchant gives that as an example. You know, and but we don't want anyone else to have that bone. Now when he meets this postman, and it happens to be a man outside, he is all up in his face like pet me, pet me, loves him. <laughs> There's the barrier. It's a good example to think about it. But if he meets him face to face, it's like, hi, you're my friend, but I mean, he like could almost take the door down just with his hair up on his back and his t-shirt. So, you know, what ways do we do that to protect ourselves? <laughs> Parker, it's enough. Okay. So come here. Good girl. 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 Ish Allah, my Allah. 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 Ish Allah, Mabud Allah. Ish Allah, Mabud Allah. Ish Allah, Mabud So think of these three phases ongoing 
and what gives inner abiding happiness. Let me see if I can watch one more thing. Um, it's a beautiful quote and I often give it when I speak outside the community as a kind of uh, touchstone. Let's see if I can find it. If you ever wonder, they say that uh, they usually Sufis say that the the universes upon universes are comprised of ish. The fabric of existence is ish. Uh, is you know ish? You know is that all inclusive of peace and compassion and forgiveness and beauty and harmony and everything? You know why is it just ish uh, as love? You know, is ish peace? You know, what would the world be if, if the world was comprised of peace? Or just comprised of compassion? You know, I mean, all the great illuminated souls speak of love. You know, it's, it's a good question. I have brought this subject up because, you know, I'm part of a peace pledge pilgrimage. And I've tried to get us to shift the language. You know, I said, you know, in fact, I'm not sure peace is even a good word to use anymore because it's so closely associated with war. You know, the minute you say peace, you think of its opposite. So I think also you could do that with love. You know, there's something there that comes, the con immediate contradiction arises. So I think about things as, um, you know, more like, it's like, Tried phrase now, but a kind of um, sustainability is one of them. You know, I mean, they say uh, peace is just war held in check. You know that those. If you think about it. If you look historically, that's true. Um, but I also think about it as resilience. How resilient are we? That that's a very important thing. How resilient are we? How resilient is nature? If left alone, can it recover? Um, those are things that we have, you know, we need to let let things be as they are, as they're intended to be. If you say Shanti, Shanti feels different than the word peace. Yeah. Shanti seems to be pointing at this calm, abiding inner relaxed this child pure shop always says you know the royal ease mm -hmm. this royal ease because you know the, you know if you're in the royal ease you're relaxed of all tension of all anxiety of all fear everything is left just the shot yeah what does he say abandon all i said i think merchant sam used to say that um, pure shop uh, often quotes, uh, there's a sign over the door to heaven, abandon all something here. Tension, I think it is. Abandon all tension here, you know, and then pass through the gate. Do you know that phrase? He says it often. I, oh, go ahead, Jen. I just was going to say, I keep feeling it also, this, you know, thinking of that ish, it's, it's, well, now I lost the thought because it's related to it. Shanti. Shanti. But it's that acceptance. Like it's just this all expansive acceptance and what you were saying. Those different things being. Also is interested because I think it's the story of Layla and Majmi about how the, isn't it one of them becomes, the, they're at the tree longing and they become the tree. Mm -hmm. And pure life would describe it in that way. Like there are some vines that attach themselves to trees and then they become an integral part of the tree. So that in nature we also see that. It doesn't smother the tree, it doesn't kill the tree, but it becomes integrated into the tree. And that's what we want to do is we commingle that way. So, Here's this one last, it's from the Guyon, 
And if my eyes were closed, I wouldn't. It encapsulates this whole class. True happiness is the love stream that springs from one's soul. And the person who will allow the stream to flow continually in all conditions, in all situations, however difficult, will have will have a happiness that truly belongs to that person. It's not the fault of others that we don't love us the way we want to be loved or that they disappoint us. If we let it destroy us, it's our fault. And to keep saying and being turned and being turned and being turned to look somewhere else. So please take that to heart and make friends with everything. Give it a big hug. So I'll send this out if you're on our mail list. Uh, you'll get this and I'll study, send the study guide and the practices. So again, remember the first phase is stilling the mind. The next phase is offering it, melting it in the fire of divine love. And then pouring the sacred herb onto it. This is through our practices and meditative absorption, which gives us clear insight into reality with the big R. It gives us insight into our own conditions, into the conditions of others, perhaps the conditions of the world. So that we are not overwhelmed by them. The easy thing is, people often contact me about this. What can we do? It's good to be an activist. Of course it's good to be. And yet, we can't do it all. But what can we do? In our own sphere, we can do our practices, commit to that, so that we elevate ourselves, and by doing so, we elevate those around us. This is what we can do. It is an ever-widening ripple effect. Tune your instrument and by tuning your own instrument, you help bring others into tune. They may take longer to tune their instruments. That's okay. That's their business. Perseverance, that's what Zorba Ricochet said in the beginning. Perseverance. O oh, thou who art the perfection of love, Harmony and beauty, Lord of heaven and of earth, open our hearts that we may hear thy voice, which constantly comes from within. Disclose to us thy divine light, which is hidden in our souls, that we may know and understand life better. Most merciful and compassionate God, give us thy great goodness. Teach us thy loving forgiveness. Raise us above the distinctions and differences which divide. Send us the peace of thy divine spirit and unite us all in thy perfect being. And we ask that if anything here has been a benefit, that it may benefit all beings.